Bonjour, class. We're going to talk a little bit about French neoclassical tragedy today. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to this in class on Wednesday, uh, but hopefully this will give you enough of a background information so that when we dive into Andromache for next Monday, it will make a little bit more sense. Because we're moving into French tragedy, we're going to change our class greetings to bonjour and au revoir to say goodbye. So bonjour is good day. Okay, so French neoclassical tragedy. Um, just to give you some rough timelines, we're looking at the mid to late uh, 1600s into the early 1700s in France. This movement is coinciding uh, with the end of the Renaissance in all of um, in all of Europe, and also we are inching towards the French Revolution in France. So if you can imagine um, very powerful kings uh, and a very powerful aristocratic class in France at the time, uh, with a lot of leisure time and a lot of money, um, and um, a lot of uh, interest in the ancient world and education. So we'll come back to that momentarily. Um, but neoclassical French tragedy uh, is just situated a little bit later than Shakespearean tragedy. But there doesn't seem to be much interplay between the two genres. Um, the French tragedians were a little bit more influenced by, uh, by tragedy in Italy and not so much by what was happening in England. Um, so that's just a little bit of background information. Let's look at some performance contexts. Uh, as was the case in England, um, French tragedy and, and drama in general, not just tragedies, but um, all drama, was, was available to, um, to French citizens at any time. All right, so this, there wasn't a particular holiday or religious festival um, or, or event that theater was tied to anymore. It was one of many different kinds of entertainments. Um, that were available to the people of France, um, both of the upper and lower classes, both men and women. Um, so there was no one context, uh, but the performance spaces were becoming a little bit more defined and uh, did differ from the performance spaces of Renaissance England. So if you remember the Globe Theater in London that had, that was out, you know, open air theater um, with the stage that could be surrounded by the groundlings and the very elaborate stage building. Uh, what we're moving to in neoclassical France is called a Proscanium Theater. And the Proscanium Theater is really the forerunner of our modern theaters. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some different theater setups in our, in our, what we think of as our modern day, but the Proscanium is the more traditional uh, setup. So some new vocabulary for you to learn. Proscanium arch, um, stage, and apron. These are all really important terms. But essentially the major difference is that the stage itself, um, instead of kind of being thrust out among the uh, audience members, um, was set behind what was called the proscanium arch. Um, and the arch takes the place of a, a background building or some sort of stage building. Um, behind the stage as a backdrop, uh, the French created scenery paintings. All right, so instead of having a building like the uh, like the Skene or the Skyna from the ancient world and then the the stage building of the Globe Theater, they didn't have any of that. They created um, a really beautiful painting uh, to relate the scenery of where we were uh, at, for, in the play itself. Uh, the arch uh, creates something like a picture frame, and so these are sometimes called picture frame theaters for that reason. So if you're in the audience down here, you are looking in uh, to the action around this occasionally very elaborate frame. The frame also allows for the use of a curtain now. So some theaters would install curtains that we're, we're used to seeing a curtain rise or fall um, between acts or between, um, between scenes, uh, but that was a relatively new innovation. There's also a part of the stage um, that's called the apron. So the apron sits in front of the arch. Some aprons are very large and provide a whole lot of extra um, performance space, and some aren't quite so, um, not quite so big. So proscanium arch, 
stage, apron, and then remember there's a background painting for scenery too. Uh, this is a, a drawing of one of the original theaters, um, one of the original uh, permanent theaters that were was erected in France in the 17th century. So previous to uh, these permanent theaters being erected, um, the French were using lots of temporary spaces. So they would use, uh, they could create, you know, wooden stages that they could, you know, take up, put up and take down whenever the performances were done. Um, they also used places like hotels or inn yards. Um, I also, I find this very amusing. They also used um, indoor tennis courts. So if they were, didn't have any other place to put on a plate, they would take down the nets and put up a stage on one end of the court. So the establishment of permanent theaters allowed for some of these innovations that we just talked about. Um, this was one of the originals, and you can see the proscanium setup where we do have um, a very clear arch here. This one has a um, curtain attached to it. Um, the stage and the apron, not a very wide apron here, but the, the apron also has stairs leading up to the stage itself. And you can see gallery seating. So very similar to the way the globe was set up where you had gallery seating and standing room, um, a standing room area for the audience. Um, this original stage had those options as well. This is another proscenium theater from uh, Germany. Uh, and what I wanted to point out was this very elaborate, very beautiful um, scenery painting uh, that was very influenced by Renaissance painting and some of the innovations in Renaissance painting that created depth and perspective in these two-dimensional spaces. Um, the apron here is much larger, and you can see that the galleries connect uh, to the proscanium arch itself. One other picture I want to show you, this is actually a theater here in Greensboro. I don't know if any of you have been to the Carolina Theater downtown, um, but this is, uh, it, it used to be a movie house and it's used for all kinds of different um, uh, different performances here now, but you can see a very beautifully ornate proscanium arch. You can see the curtain is down, um, hiding the stage a small apron, but what this theater has that the others didn't is an orchestra. So if we think about the ancient world, the orchestra was the dancing space for the chorus. In the modern world, the orchestra is now the playing place for the musicians. So it's still that kind of semicircular um, shape, but it's much smaller and it's usually uh, created as a pit so that the musicians are actually sitting much lower than where the audience would be sitting. Okay, so some elements of drama, again, that help to differentiate uh, neoclassical French tragedy from other genres. Uh, first of all, the scenery. Again, because there's no skene or skyna, there is no, um, there is no building set up as the backdrop for the action of the play. Uh, we have perspective painting. All right, so that perspective, again, is that element of creating depth, distance uh, in a 2D medium. Actors, um, much like Shakespeare's time, uh, were arranged into acting troops, but major difference here, both men and women could act. All right, so uh, we are finally starting to see women on stage um, and not necessarily, necessarily exploitative situations as they might have been um, back in ancient Rome. And the costumes, um, again, uh, kind of following the trend in England, there were no masks that were worn. Um, and most costumes, even uh, you know, regardless of when the action was taking place, uh, reflected contemporary clothing styles because most actors had to provide their own costumes. So it could only be as elaborate as the actor could afford. Um, so that's just uh, some of the smaller differences. And we can talk more about um, actors and the uh, social perception and social expectations of actors and actresses uh, when we meet again. Okay, so this is another area where uh, neoclassical French tragedy really stands out from Renaissance drama or from uh, ancient drama. There were actually quite a few rules that were attached to uh, neoclassical French tragedy by um, the schools that 
taught literature and taught drama and by the playwrights who um, the playwrights who wrote the plays uh, that became classics in the genre. Uh, the, th the first kind of set of rules was called the Three Unities, and this actually comes from uh, an, ancient, an ancient Greek philosopher named Aristotle, who wrote a piece um, called the Poetics, and the Poetics was his sort of literary scholarly criticism of uh, ancient Greek tragedy. And he talked about the rules for Greek tragedies and what made a Greek tragedy very good. Um, so the three unities for the French kind of echo the rules that um, that Aristotle created for Greek tragedy. And these should be uh, relatively familiar to us because we talked about these restrictions at the beginning of the semester. So all of the action has to take place in 24 hours, and it all has to happen in one location. So time and place are the first two unities. And the third unity is called action. All of the action has to revolve around one plot. So even if there are multiple characters, um, there shouldn't be too many subplots. They should all be sort of working around the same conflict. French class, uh, neoclassical French tragedy was also interested in decorum and verisimilitude. So two important terms. Decorum meant that the behavior of the actor had to resemble the role that she or he was playing. So a king should look and act like a king and a peasant should look and act like a peasant, right? It should be, it should match, right? Your expectations should be met, should be met. And verisimilitude uh, referred to the action of the play. So if decorum was about the behavior of the characters, verisimilitude was about the action of the play. Um, and verisimilitude stipulated that situations sh should be true to life. So no supernatural elements, no intrusions from the gods, no deus ex machina endings, no soliloquies where a character is just talking to no one. The idea was that um, all of these, the action on stage should also feel um, relatable and feel familiar. Structure, form, and purpose were also some new rules that were set on the uh, that were set on these plays. So first, all plays had to have a five-act structure, very similar to the ancient Greek form. Um, Seneca and then Shakespeare himself ado adopts this five-act structure. Um, they wanted to preserve purity of form, meaning that there were comedies and there were tragedies and they could not mix. So any, you know, there shouldn't be dramedies. There should be no elements of comedy in your tragedy and no elements of tragedy in your comedy. And the purpose uh, for these plays was, of course, to entertain, but to also educate. So most of these stories revolve around a moral. And if we think back, and not, not a moral in a, a Christian sense or a biblical sense, but in, um, in a sort of lesson learned. And if we think about um, the questions that we asked about Greek tragedy and Roman tragedy, you know, what is the tragic worldview? What are we trying to understand about human experience from, from, these, um, from these stories? We're going to ask those same sorts of questions in French neoclassical tragedy. Now, in terms of narrative, you know, different narrative uses, we're going to hold off on that uh, and speak to that after we read Andromache and see what Racine does that um, is or isn't familiar to us from some of our other um, our other tragedians. And I should also mention, I feel kind of silly, I didn't bring this up to begin with, but the term neoclassical, what does that mean? Um, so neoclassical it means new classical, which isn't that surprising. But much as the Renaissance was a rebirth of interest in the ancient world, neoclassical tragedy um, consciously tries to imitate uh, some of those elements of ancient tragedy, which we just talked about with the unities and um, decorum and verisimilitude and structure, form, and purpose. You can see there's a very clear uh, line of connection there to the ancient world. But also all of these stories, um, not all of them, but many of these uh, tragic stories. Oh, sorry, excuse my, excuse my notifications. Some of these tragic stories are about Greek myths um, and Roman myths. So they are adapting stories by Euripides and Sophocles and Seneca. All of these poets that we've been studying um, are going to see new life. 
Okay, so that's it for today, and I will see you all on Monday. Au revoir.